So and then the rest of you are, are here because security and computers and stuff like that? For the for the Okay. okay. It's just a good place to uh, hear new ideas and uh, learn something. Okay. okay. Well, I'll try to scare you all to death. Um, you know, because you've been there. Yeah. <laughs> I so described myself as paranoid oh, because I studied enough information security. 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 Yeah. You'll be afraid of it. Yeah. 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 Some yeah. of that will be technical. We have a laptop that has to be fired up and just one time. We will have to pick phone things later on that we can do too. And this is always a question I ask for each of my courses at the university. How many of you guys uh, and ladies have a MySpace page? Zero. <laughs> Good, at last. I still have one or two last semester. And then how many of you are on Facebook? Yeah. Now see, for a while they thought, oh, no, Facebook, not anymore. It's going to be Snapchat. Well, what was your first question? I didn't get it. MySpace was before Facebook. And it's essentially the same kind of thing. You have your own page, you put stuff on there, and your friends would post stuff on there. And uh, it was very big when I got here in 2006. All my students were in MySpace. Does anybody know what Friendster was? Friendster. Okay. Friendster was the idea. It's like the guy who invented it. Right? It didn't get rich off of it. But that was even before MySpace. And these things succeed each other one after another. Well, Facebook hung on. Because for a while they thought Snapchat, they're going to take over and Pinterest, people didn't walk into those. But nope, everyone's in Facebook. So, so has everybody already sent your privacy settings on Facebook? There's a lot of them, and they're all over the place. So, go learn that one, because that's worth doing. I did not get on Facebook until my AITP students got a Facebook page. And I'm the sponsor for the group, so then I had to get Facebook. <laughs> Very cool. So I'll do a quick intro again, just for, uh, is, that, is it online? Is it being going up? So I'm Drew, uh, I'm the president and one of the co-founders of Code R2D. And uh, I've got Rene here, he's one of our other co-founders, and he's the, the treasurer of the group, so he's my man. Um, um, how many of you guys have been to a Code R2D session before? Good, so I don't really have to explain too much about it. For those of y'all that haven't, we, we started about four years ago. Um, our tagline is building better nerds, and our whole goal is to bring people in and teach them about technology in various ways, shapes, and forms. We do this on the first and third Thursday of the month here at the Mission Seat Building. We're gonna be adding some sessions and moving some sessions around. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many of y'all would attend if we had one of these sessions in Edinburgh? Would it be, would it be, <laughs> would it be would it be better or worse? I don't know how to show hands, but where it used to be. Huh? Where, where it used to be. Where it used to be? Because it's more central. Yeah, the problem with the where it used to be is it was too, it was too loud. We didn't have all the facilities there. The location. No. The location. Where would you guys rather it be? Here, Edinburgh, or Macau? Central Macau? Here. Here. Edinburgh. Here. Oh, okay. Sounds like it's split. Okay, so one of our other board members owns is Daniel, who owns Grindstone in Edinburgh. So we talked about saying, well, maybe we do one in Grindstone, we do one here. Either way, things hopefully will we'll get to a better good, because as some of y'all might remember, we used to have 80 to 100 people <laughs> in all of our sessions, and now no one wants to drive commission, so you know, what are you going to do? But, um, but our sessions have always been fun, a little bit free flowing. Um, we, I think this year coming in 2017, we're going to try and change it up and make it a little bit more structured and organized the way that we do things. Um, but that's great. And so with that also, we have uh, a component where now we're branching out specifically into information security. And so tonight, we're just going to focus on that. I will ask you all to please put on your calendar to attend on January 19th here in the auditorium and in the classroom. 
because our boot students, if you follow what we do with code, our boot students have completed uh, our second cohort and they've gone, I mean, there's some great stories there. There's a guy who was a sandwich artist in some way and now he's a full stack developer. There's a guy who just got in uh, a year ago from the Philippines and now he's got four applications running. There's a, there's a bunch of people who've been able to do some neat stuff and how far they've come and they're all doing their showcases on the 19th here at the, at the Seed Building. And we'd really like it if you guys could show up and, and support them and see what kind of work they're doing. And it's, it's pretty fantastic. So uh, what we'll end up moving to is on the first Thursday, we'll do information security in one room and we'll also do our you know, standard code RGB Academy event in the second room. So we'll have a little bit of both. We'll offset the time so that you can take advantage of both at one location. It'll be a lot of fun. And after we're done in here, um, We'll go fire up the cow, if you're cool with that. We'll go have some fun with it. We'll be yeah. finding up the video switcher in. Yeah, we finally have the video switcher in, so all 15 of our displays are online. Uh, it looks pretty cool. The Xbox is plugged in, but it's pretty cool. Um, what else is going on? Happy New Year. Yay! Code's taken off this year. We're doing a lot of fun projects. So uh, if you guys are interested in volunteering or helping us out, we have lots and lots and lots of volunteers. Our Code Camp program, is doing exceptionally well. Um, we're doing that at the McGowan Public Library on the first and third Saturday of the month, and here at Seed on the second and fourth Saturday of the month. That's where we teach uh, basics and electronic circuits. Um, we teach uh, how to build AM radios. Um, we're going to start um, on the ham radio operators, so I'm going to start doing AR L classes to teach people certified operators. Um, we teach computer repair, we teach how to build a computer, we teach PHP to six year olds. <laughs> We have a lot of fun, so if, if you have any interest in teaching technology, we have a, we have a spot for you. Um, we've got that program, the Cal program, the boot program, the academy program. Tech Tuesdays are still going strong. We're moving those over to Grindstone, so the fourth Tuesday of the month, um, it's going to be happening there. And you are co-sponsoring the broadband uh, for on February the 21st. February the 21st. If you think that everyone in the Valley should have access to internet, speeds and, and connections. We're doing a big summit where we're bringing in people from local business leaders to local superintendents to the Federal Reserve Bank to hopefully someone from the FCC to talk about why broadband proliferation in the Valley isn't such a pipe dream. Uh, all it takes is a willing government and a couple of people who have a good attitude to make it happen. So we're going to look at people that have done it successfully in the Broadband Valley and people who think that it's too difficult to do in the Broadband Valley. So I'd encourage you guys to attend guys and girls. I don't mean that name. Uh, I want everyone to attend and uh, let your voices be heard. It yeah, will be in the West Dakota Cog building, which I don't know where it is, but you I believe it's on 1015. Know. It's uh, right off the expressway. It's the street, and I'm sure after I talk with Renee. Yep. So it'll be super, super fun. Lots of community interaction stuff if you guys want tech in the community. So that's it. I'm going to hand it over. Do you have any, any comments, questions, concerns? Mm -hmm. No? Okay, so Royal. Can you come up and do an introduction, please, sir? Can I bring the uh, round table? You can bring the round table. Oh. <laughs> Since this is the first official kickoff uh, for what we're doing, um, these guys have been uh, very influential in getting us to set this up. So, for, for information security, yeah, we can give us that group. There you go. So, we're the ones that basically are trying to start off information security at DOT RV. And so far we have about 20 members. Uh, we're not sure how we're going to do it yet. We haven't gotten uh, an official club started yet, but for 20 members, I think we don't even need it. So hopefully what we want to do is we want to get you certified. Uh, we want to get you to break, break up into teams and go to capture the flag events. So I guess I'll introduce this. I'm Berlin. I'm uh, Mike. So Mike, he does a lot of hardware stuff. Uh, if you want to explain a little bit about what you want, to, what you're planning on for workshops. Uh, well, for workshops, um, since I do a lot of hardware, I'm, I'm an electrical engineer student. Um, what, we, what I want to focus on first is a lot of uh, understanding the signal. I'm not really understanding the like, really understand it mess. But uh, eventually, what we'll start learning is how to essentially intercept these signals, how to jam these signals, and how to so that they can do uh, what we want them to do, what we want to send, or what we want to receive. 
And uh, I got a little interested in that after uh, having a conversation with the recruiter from the NSA. As it turns out, 40% of the NSA's workforce is electrical engineers because it's just signal, signal intercepting. And so uh, we're going to start with that, and then from there, we're going to start working. We're going to do manual attacks with hardware or stuff like that. What we're doing here is like a new charge of these students who are interested. We haven't set a time yet, but we're probably going to meet up. You don't have to be a student to attend. Uh, we're not sure yet how we're going to do certifications. If we get it through the school, you know, we can only certify people who are in the school. But if we do it uh, with the, what was the name again, the National Center in? Well, it's through, it's through Code RGB. Yeah, so it would be uh, through Code RGB. So it just depends. We have no money to send stone, but our goal is to get basically professionals made for the industry. And I'll tell you, I'll add to that that one of the things that we're helping them out with is we're going to be reaching out into local, uh, the local business community here to offer things like penetration testing. So that if you guys want to kind of get your skills, if you're at a certain point where you think it's something you can do, we will be more than happy to reach out to local banks and local institutions and say, hey, let us pin check your network or pin test your network. Um, I mean, you guys know what that's worth. It's worth tens of thousands of dollars. And if we come in and say, look, just give us a small component. It'll help you guys get a little bit of real-world experience. It'll help our local financial institutions understand, you know, what the value of that is. Um, and then for all local businesses, we can really assist in lining those opportunities up for you guys. We even tried to get a party bus, um, but they sold it. We tried to get a party bus going in. Oh, they sold it? They sold it. Next time. Yeah, well, we wanted to be able to take you guys to the to the meetups, to, or to the to the events, and to the Capture Flag events. So Renee and I were eating, and we're like, there's a party bus. Let's get that thing going. And they, but they sold it. Sorry, we tried. Right. Still rent a bus or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Allegiant has um, like 75-hour tickets to Las Vegas for that one. So we also, if you're, if you're ever going to try to find a trip to do this, look at Allegiant. Because if you get it early enough, you get like a 60 dollars from Las Vegas. Cool. Well, with that, guys, I appreciate it. Thank you for your enthusiasm and helping us get this started. You know, we started this thing when it was just like, three of us sitting around drinking beer and now we've got a whole bunch of crazy stuff that's happening. So you guys just being willing to, to do this goes a, a really long way. So Dr. Gerald Hughes is a professor at UTRGV. Um, been there for a little while. I chose to post the, the more recent picture of you than the other picture of you online. <laughs> but I will let you introduce yourself and, uh, and thanks for being here. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Department of Network Security. Right? There's another major of network engineering and another one of network administration. So it was very in depth. Uh, and I came back, and uh, my presence on the university right now is that I've done the courses in security for our major. We are in the College of Business, so we're information systems. And you'll see that a little bit in the way I talk tonight. We're going to have some tech stuff uh, and some of it. Um, well, as far as command lines, maybe a little bit. Not like electrical engineering, really. But aside from that, we're always looking at the human interaction with the technology, because it's the college of business. We're going to be solving problems with technology. And in this case, the problem is somebody's trying to break you down. So we're going to look at sort of the causes and, and ways things happen, not just technically, but also in terms of the human interaction that, that drives that in the first place. Um, I have a course, uh, Information 4391, Information Systems is the name of our department now. 4391 is Network Security. And uh, we use a, a book by Mark Chiantop, who's a really excellent uh, author in Network Security. Has lots of hands-on type exercises. Now that's an expensive textbook, but if you find one online and just do all the stuff at the end of its chapters, then you're close to ready to taking the comp TIA. Has anybody taken that one already, the 301 and the 401? Okay, just watch out. The 401 is a big old change from the 301. And it's because of some of the things I'm talking about tonight. Generally, the, the internet has the effect of making information far more transparent than it used to be. And what happened to the previous version of the test was that it all got dumped online every last question over and over. 
And you could go through and just find enough um, old tests that were posted all over the internet if you're looking for these things. They made it more difficult, a lot more difficult, to pass that test. The 401 is now based on scenarios and simulations. Nevertheless, it's a really good starter. If you go through uh, InfoSec stuff, through their sessions, and then memorize, I'm sorry, like 400 acronyms <laughs> and about 600 more definitions of technologies, you'll be ready to go. There's just no way around that. And it's worse for the CISSP and some of the other things. But, yes, go ahead. Okay, well, question, comment. Um, so recruiters out of every major IT organization are aware of the CompTIA weaknesses, and that is why they deprioritize resumes with CompTIA certification. It's a starter certification. Right. They call it a varsity. So. But what, what are they, if it's, if it's going to become more lab driven, like something like the CCMA, um, what, what is CompTIA or, in, or anybody teaching the class or evangelizing it? Are, is there any plan in place to help re evangelize If it's going to become too, because I, I have heard this. That's a good question. And I just found this out recently that the 401 is such a, a big difference. I'm sure they're reacting to the market. They're also reacting to the fact that people stole all their texts, right? Mm -hmm. And it's strictly a knowledge test. That's the main problem there. If you do the CPA certified ethical hacker, then that's much more of a uh, hands on, practical, um, uh, skills type of test. And most, most companies have moved away from it altogether and done the ability to use a CCNA, like they're being, if you have CCNA or not, or, or going through true ability or, or true test or hacker, or hacker rank. And, and the SANS group, the SANS security group has a lot of good tests, right? So, there's a, a wide variety. The current CISO at uh, UTRGP apparently holds 22 certifications. So he just takes everything, right? And it, it, it'll depend a little bit on what your focus is. But um, the, the CompTIA, I'm getting students in who are business majors, first of all. And they only have me for 30 hours, right? We've got 30 hours of computer information systems. And then that's it because it's a PGA degree. Not like an M, uh, or like an MBA, except the lower division. So they are learning business and 30 hours of computing, not at all like computer science or computer engineering degree. Okay, so that's that's enough about the background. Um, I, I created those courses for the university, and um, I created this presentation just for y'all because uh, they were asking about privacy and so on. I don't actually have a lot of Facebook stuff in there. I asked before. Um, Facebook has a lot of settings an awful lot of settings, and they're not all in one place. So what you want to do is find a couple of good tutorials and find all those places and just turn everything the heck off. Is anybody not using Facebook? I'll take you out for dinner. There you go, you see? <laughs> Got one hand not using Facebook. Is that because you're in Snapchat and Pinterest and Instagram instead? I have, I have Pinterest and I have YouTube. Okay, well, no, no, don't get that. <laughs> it's back to the social platform. She's moved on. The rest of y'all are still on Facebook. But that really does make a difference, right? This is part of what they call your attack surface. That the more things you put out there, the more things there are in the market. So, um, you see I've got the question up here, is there privacy in the 21st century? And my answer already is no. This actually turned up when I was defending my dissertation it was about digital information goods. We were talking about digital information goods moving over the internet. And they asked me, what do you think about privacy? And I said, privacy is over. And I made a, an economic argument at that time. And the economic argument is that the transaction cost of acquiring information is so small that it means that the information becomes far more transparent than it would have been before there was an internet. Now, if you had asked a security question in 1950, uh, what is your mother's maiden name, that would have done a fairly good job for you at that time. If you see that question now, you can find somebody's, mother, or somebody's mother's maiden name right away because all these records are public records and they're posted online. You can search them right away. So just that economic factor that you don't have to go through the effort to acquire the information in the first place means that privacy is basically broken down. Right? And I've got only about nine or 10 slides here to show you all the ways in which that's happened. All right, so these are the digital footprints that you leave around. Now, there's always been public records. Who was born and died and who divorced and who married who. And these were sitting in county courthouses. And they were always um, 
in files on paper. And those are still around. So at best, you could call somebody and have them look up a file for you. But probably you're going to go someplace and look at it. So nowadays, and I'll just use myself as an example, you can do a public record search right online. And there's some services. Has anybody ever paid for one of those? The dollar ninety-nine search, the nine ninety-nine search. Okay. Now employers will use those. Okay, they'll get a membership, and they'll search everybody that makes it past the first stage, and they'll see what's going on. If they're really good, they can just do it themselves. But here's a search for Gerald Hughes. Last time I did this, I turned up somebody in Huntsville Prison. <laughs> um, but it should find me. There we go. We have the, the wrong one down below, because you can see I'm not 84 years old. And there's, okay. Now you would have had to know a few more things about me here, but I will just tell you, please do not go and use all this information against me. Right? <laughs> Those are all the places I've lived, and these are all my relatives. Okay? My, uh, my little brother here lives in Kentucky. This is my mom. They spelled that wrong years ago on a credit card, still there. I don't know who these numbers are. None of those are right. But that's my wife. And there's my brother, Jonathan, and they have nailed it down. Like, that's a lot of relatives. And one of the ways this might be applied would be something called social engineering. So you start talking to somebody who has information about me. And they'll say, oh yeah, Jonathan told me to call. Gerald was just down here the other day and he's talking to his brother. And, da, 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 da. and you use that information to gain confidence on the other end of the line because of all this stuff that you did in two seconds, right? You can, Queer yourself. Now, as young as most of you are, you're probably safer than I am, right? I've been hanging out there all this time. There's one more there. Right, now that one you could have told is me, right? They found me in McAllen, Texas. I don't know what I did. Maybe it was paying taxes or owning a house or something, but you can see I was in New York City for a long time, about 18 years, I lived in Brooklyn. Don't do that unless you're really determined, okay? <laughs> I like Texas much better. But there's my dad again, Gerald Stevens, and my wife, and so they picked it up. And those are the right phone numbers. Age is wrong, I'm 55. <laughs> All right, so that's the, the information transparency problem. Government records, I mean things that, um, you have to turn these things into them anyway. Okay, so the main one is your tax returns. And that has a personal identifier, which, well, I went to college back in 1979. These things were just posted right up. They had like the final grades at the end. They put your number up there. My social security number and there's a grade I got in the class, right? But nowadays, the social security number is like the most treasured hidden piece of information that you have with the government, by all means. Don't ever tell anybody your social security number. And one of the worst ones now is uh, the phone uh, call, the social engineering, do we need to do something out of the IRS? Do we want to confirm this is your social security number? Because uh, 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 uh. that's how it all goes south and you get your identity stolen. So all that stuff is in there. Now, when you start talking about privacy and advocates for privacy, the next one is the really big one, the consumer right? Because here, you leave tracks all over the place. Now, is there anybody here who will only pay cash? <laughs> only pay, you, know, you only ever pay cash? Yes, I have to. Like, I list my money on the card. Like, I don't have to pay cash. There you go. Okay, you should all go home and do that. Now, now there's a downside to that. Means you're carrying around cash, okay? So, I did that in New York City. It's not a great idea, but I'm a big guy and I can get away with it. So, carrying around cash has its own risk. But, every time you use any kind of electronic payment, you're leaving another one of these um, digital records around. And you're leaving it in somebody's database who may not be taking good care of it at all. In fact, they may be taking very poor care of it. I've got a research paper I'm working on right now about security breaches. And there are more instances of security breaches of companies, of their databases, with your information on them, including your credit card number and your home address and everything, than I can get into the paper. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. 
And they are trying hard. But the hacker population is huge and highly skilled. And those databases are going to be compromised. Um, there was a record set. It wasn't that it, it was set at that time, but we learned about it just in the last couple of months or so. You know about the, the biggest exposure of passwords ever? John yeah. 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 Apparently top of a billion, okay? And I've been in Yahoo since 1996. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never got, excuse me, I'm getting over a cough. I had those same email accounts because it would be so much work to migrate an email. I've hung on onto them all this time and I'm trying to migrate from one set of passwords to the next thing. Cross my fingers, hoping it's okay. But Yahoo is a, a computer company. They are in the business of doing this. Okay? It's not like even Ford and GM, they're very, they're very good at tech. But it's not their core business. Yahoo, it's their core business and they couldn't protect it. Right, that happened starting back in 2013, and apparently that information is for sale all over the internet, all kinds of stuff. So, if you're still in Yahoo, um, you need to change all your information. I right? change your passwords. Is anybody still in Yahoo? I'm like the last. Oh, there we go. See, no longer change your passwords. Okay, that's right. Okay, well, watch out. Those consumer records are. Be probably the, the most numerous uh, piece. Hang on a second. I had this open before. Um, no, that's an actual. Okay, I'll just leave that up there. Um, social media platforms. I talked about that a little bit with the Facebook and the MySpace. Now, those are things where you're going to expose your own information because you just chose to do it. Uh, I just use this one because, well, I'm not the I write music and I post online, right? so soon. SoundCloud is another social platform. The idea is these are all crowdsourced. The content comes from the outside. And even here, I notice um, I'm probably the, the lowest ranked musician on here, right? Nobody ever listens to this stuff. But not long after I signed up and started posting, I started getting these friends, and they would send me messages and stuff. Well, they're trying to get me to follow them back and offering me ways to get lots of followers. If you pay X dollars, we'll get you a thousand followers. And so it's just another way. Now they know who I am, right? Now they know where it is. I use my real name. I, I thought about that, but I threw caution to the winds and put it up. Um, when you put on things now, like Facebook, there's a whole other level. If you put a picture of yourself on Facebook now, what's the exposure? Do you know what the new thing is from last year? The new face recognition, okay? It will figure it out, and it'll tag you, and it'll put you right on there, and you have to go and change those settings. Now, the settings are the same for the consumer one that we were looking at before, and for this one, it's called opt-in or opt-out. Now, the way all the businesses do this is that they will turn the feature on. And if you want more privacy, then you have to opt out. Now, early in the days of the internet, long about 1998 or 99, this was relatively simple. When you saw the thing, there'd be a little checkbox and you could opt out. Nowadays, you kind of have to burrow down into it and find it. You may have to send them an email. It's a long process because it's in the company's financial interest to have that feature turned on. They would rather have all that information being exchanged through all the members that are there. Now here's the bad news. Once they started this opt-in and opt-out, there was some um, legislation that came around that was proposed in different ways, and uh, some people did some studies, and they found out that even when a company said, we have an opt-in, opt-out policy, and if you opt-out, we will not use your data, da, 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 da. So they began to publish privacy policies because the law says you have to. And the research found that even when the consumer opts out of that feature, they would still sell their data, expose their data, send it to their third party affiliates, even though that was the point of having the policy in the first place. So that's one of the reasons I, I put that, that uh, answer to the question up there on the title of it. No, even when they have an opt out and you go through all the steps and you do it, 
almost half of the companies are still likely to expose your data. And then the last thing that makes it even more tricky is that these companies buy and sell each other. They spin off things. They sell packages of data to each other. Um, some of you have been through this already. I see the great parents in the audience. But when you have a child, watch out. You are going to be in everybody's database. And they are going to be sending you ads for everything. I had my first child in 1999 in Brooklyn. And that hospital took my information and man, they rolled it out the door. I was getting all kinds of stuff. You go to the grocery store, they're giving you diaper coupons every time. For six years they did that. So that's a, uh, the, the consumer side of it. Opt-in, opt-out, it's just plain broke. Internet tracking. Oh yeah, this one is just uh, something I'm gonna show you inside the browser. You can go in here and look at this area. Um, anybody still using Internet Explorer? Uh, okay, because I was just going to say, go home now. Right? It is too late for you. The only reason I say that is because Internet Explorer, now here's why things happen, right? Microsoft owns well over 90% of the platforms that are in the PC architecture. Now there's lots of other ways to go. And I'm a Netscape faithful. I held on to Netscape <laughs> until they went down like a Titanic. But I was hanging on for two things. Number one, that was the Mozilla browser, and that was open source, and it was not Microsoft. Now, why does Microsoft own 90% of the platforms, and why would that have anything to do with security? Does anybody know how Microsoft got to that number? <laughs> Okay, here's the story. Back when these PCs were first being made, IBM, and that was brand name by the way, PC, personal computer, was a brand name. They built the AT and the XT architecture, the motherboards and the chipsets and the way that things plugged into them. And they open licensed that architecture. And that's why there are PCs in all the businesses and Apple is for sort of artsy show-offs who are really good at video and things like that, right? photoshopping. Because Apple had a closed system, it was proprietary. You cannot swap in pieces out of an Apple like you can a PC. All right, so that was a good deal for IBM. And they began making a lot of those machines. And a lot of third-party people began making them as well. And they needed an operating system. And Microsoft bought one from a guy who figured out how to use the Intel chipset uh, for the CPU to make a very simple operating system. I think he paid 50 grand for it. And he got the license to be original equipment manufacturer, uh, supplier of the operating system for IBM. And that was a smart move because Bill Gates is worth $80 billion now. That's why, okay? He was there right at the beginning and he followed it through. And every time a cool innovation came up, like, uh, oh, I don't know, Windows, he would adopt it. It was Windows 1, which didn't work at all, and Windows 2, which is trash. And Windows 3.10 sort of worked, and then 3.11, that's where I came in, that started working. And he's followed those stages all the way along. Now, what that means is he's got platform control. That if everybody has that operating system, then he has the ability to gain the revenues from all the things that go with that. All the equipment that's going to be made for it, all the software that's going to be plugged in there. They built their own office suite, and there were other ones. And again, this is like old timers day now. Word Perfect, yeah. <laughs> Word Perfect 5, the perfect word process. But word Star 2000. Word Star, yeah. Word is I didn't love Word Star. No one loved Word Star. <laughs> <laughs> and nowadays, it's just. And I didn't buy an office until my employer, I had a, a, a telework employer in Israel that said, you have to get an office now. I said, well, you buy it for me. And they paid $1,000 for me to get the whole suite. <laughs> so that is owned by Microsoft and platform control. This is the most important platform control thing they ever did. Because the internet was coming on. And that was a different platform. Now, what that means for Microsoft and this is why everyone makes fun of Microsoft now for security, is because people have broken Microsoft of 
thousand times, ten thousand times. There's more exploits for Microsoft software than you can keep track of because they are the big fat target. If there's a few RC Apple users out there on their machines, then if you make an enormous amount of effort to create a zero day exploit for an Apple machine, then you'll crack a few hundred RC machines in care. But if you make a zero day for Windows 10, you're gold. And you're going to make a lot of money off that one because that's a big fat target. And they integrated Internet Explorer into the browser, sorry, into the operating system in such a way that you could not remove it. The court case actually said, pull it out. And it couldn't be done. It was already into the system. Now that meant that that was a big old target. And that's why I make fun of, of uh, Internet Explorer, because it is not safe. It's still this huge target. Now the latest one is Edge. Anybody using Edge? Apparently Edge is really cool. It's really good. It's way more secure than it was before. Um, I just have a bad attitude, so I'm still in Mozilla. I ain't on forever, right? Um, actually, I've switched to Opera. If uh, y'all are all computer guys anyway, you should really be in Opera. It's kind of like a developer's browser. So it's got a lot more controls and things that you can get under the hood with. Nevertheless, this is a page. You can see about preferences is the way to get here. Um, and you can also just go through the menus to, to do it. And it's got a little bit of stuff on privacy. It's not much at all. But the main thing is that there are trackers, and you can use do not track settings. When you go around to any website, the websites that are there are placing cookies on your machine. They're watching to see where you go. They want to get information about how you use the website. It's useful for them. So this is about the most minimal I've ever seen for a privacy control. There's not much going on here. But do not track is at least a, a shot at it. So that's about all there is to do there. Now, there's also hidden internet tracking. And I've got this one. Is what they call local shared objects. Anybody come across this one before? Local shared objects, okay. That's on the certification test, so just memorize that, okay. LSO, local shared object. It's like a cookie but it behaves differently and it's controlled in a completely different place. We will look at cookies a little bit later. Um, cookie is just a piece of information. When you go to the website, they will send some, um, it, it'll be something of interest mostly to them that you came, you looked at this, maybe you opened that link. Um, a way for them to bring you back, for example, to where you were before, or if they know what your interests are, they can uh, put an identifier and say, oh look, it's Gerald again, let's show him another flight to Cancun or whatever that was. This is the hidden cookie, and you know, I've, I've dialed this down, if you go and look in your machines, you can do that later if you want, there will be usually set right here about 100 uh, KB of local shared objects data, and then these will both be checked, that you will allow the third party flash content, the components, and I grant, I grant this, this may be a real thing, right? To reduce download times. Well, I do have Time Warner. I don't love Time Warner. It's a love-hate relationship. But I get 16 megabits a second. I don't need download times from local shared objects. This is unknown data being stored on the computer. Now this is not about hacking so much as it is about your privacy. That when you show up, they already know who you are. They know you've been there before. They know what you're doing. It's about your privacy. You've gotten off the first slide. And this is where it all goes south. Um, I noticed y'all got your uh, your keyboard switch working in the cow, is that right? The, the, you guys, the, the, yeah. You got a KVM in the yeah. a 15 well, way? It's a, yeah, it's a 15 way splitter. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things you can do is hack the firmware on a KVM, a keyboard video uh, management switch. So you can share monitors, you can share keyboards and stuff like that. Especially for big back systems, you may have just one keyboard and you want to switch to all the different machines. Well, all these devices work with software. And a lot of that software is updatable. And if you go in and you replace the firmware with certain hacked pieces of zero day, then you can make their keyboard switch a keylogger. 
And that's one of the main ways that someone would eavesdrop on you. This is where your privacy would be violated if a keylogger gets installed on your machine and every stroke and every click that you make. And they're mostly just interested in the password stroke. Sooner or later, you're going to log into some place. You're going to enter that key or, or the, the password, and then they'll have it. So they'll get reams of data out of these things and go searching for that data. Now, one of the reasons that's useful, and they found this out several times, including the latest Yahoo, is that people reuse their passwords. So tell me the truth. Who has a different password for every single sign-on you've got? There is no duplication. Oh, congratulations, I love you all. Now, is that because you're using a password manager? That's it. Okay. Or because you've memorized 400 passwords. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I'm about here. Right? I might be able to add two or three more because I got a system. But it's not easy to handle. And the reusable password, that's where it all breaks down, right? If they get one of them, then they will own so many other things that you have as well. So at the very least, you need to do this. If you're going to be using passwords for all kinds of crap all over the place and Facebook, whatever, fine. But if you're going to do online banking, that better be the only place you ever use that one, and it better be long and hard. Uh, this is another question I always do with my classes. How many of you are online <coughs> banking? Well, shame on you all. Go home and stop doing that. Okay? <laughs> now, this is the paranoid level. I'm at the paranoid level because I've done the training and I just don't want to have that exposure. Now, I don't need to. My bank is across the street from the university. I can walk there if I need to. And this is, again, uh, your old folks know when you would go to the bank and you would write a check for $25 cash because you needed cash for the week. So you did. And that, that's what I did. Now, those days are also gone. Right? So we have ATMs and cash isn't what it used to be. But think about the level of convenience that online banking adds to your life, and then compare that to the fact that somebody might key log you, they might shoulder surf you, they might get to hold of your phone, they might uh, get into your account and steal your identity and empty it. Um, once you get all those good security jobs and start making six figures, you're going to suddenly care about online banking way more than you might be doing right now. So. That's just the, the paranoid principle. I, I don't online bank. Very seriously, I have never opened an online bank account, and I don't intend to. It's part of what's called minimize your attack surface. And what about two-factor authentication? What do you think about two-factor authentication? <laughs> two-factor authentication makes things a lot better than it would be before. There's several ways this can go. Um, the authentication is by what you know, that's your password. By what you have, that could be like a card, a token, uh, a drive. Um, some of my software, for example, is authorized by a proprietary USB drive. If I don't have that drive, I can't run that software. Um, there was a very clever method. You send the bank a picture of yourself, and when you show up, they show you your picture. So that you can tell that's actually the bank. Um, the two-factor, is harder to get into than the other ones, but remember they have to have, when they're authenticating you, and that's where the hacker wants to be, he wants to pretend to be you, if they're going to do a replay attack and capture credentials, all those credentials have to be stored on their end somehow. Very often it's a form of caches. So if they get a hold of all the credentials, if there's two of them, they can still do it. But it is way better than it used to be. All right, now the threat to your privacy is because, first of all, databases, and then the next step, which is way harder, but they have figured it out, and they are figuring it out, which is combining databases. So uh, I know this is uh, very easy for some of you who've gone through the curriculum already. A database is electronic storage of structured information. That's the difference between having the paper I was talking about before or having it on the computer. Now, all the, all the businesses use a form of database called relational database where the data is stored in the form of tables, where you will have what's called a record, that would be one row, and for whatever that table is, that's one set of information, and then each column is one type of information. Now that's a common structure among all of them, and it makes it very easy, it's very good for you. There's so many things that you can do online and in your life and in your education and with your government because this database has your information. 
Where it comes down to your privacy is the unique identifiers. Now, as far as the database is concerned, this is the primary key. You all have these. If you uh, have a driver's license, there's a driver's license number. When uh, you get pulled over for speeding and he runs your license number, that's the key. That's attached to you. That's why he's doing it, because there's a database back in there somewhere. And that record won't be attached to anybody else, just me. So that's a primary key for that one. Social security is also uh, a unique number. And then you have to have a, a unique key for every single uh, table that you have in a database. And once you start linking tables together, that's where the privacy begins to break down. Um, these are stored on servers, those are just computers. They tend to be not like the ones that you're using at home, but at uh, big rack machines of some kind in a data center. And then the fact that you can uh, uh, get to all this because of network and internet access. Okay? I'm talking really long, so I'm gonna skip the Gutenberg project, but it's a really great resource. Has anybody seen that one already? These are texts that are out of copyright. So um, there's all the classics that you can think of, uh, Mark Twain and Charles Dickens and everything else. Uh, you want to read some stuff, there's a long, long list. The Gutenberg Project stores it all. You can query it out by all kinds of stuff. The author's name, the topic you want to read about, the type of stuff that's up there. It's a public database. So I was going to run some example queries, but that's what the people who are violating your privacy are going after, is these records in these databases keyed on those unique identifiers. That's why you need to keep those numbers safe. Now there's just a few things that have already happened. The, um, the legislative side of this is about 20 years behind the state of the art, maybe 30 depending on how you're counting. The Grand Legal Body <coughs> Act says that your personally identifiable financial information has to be kept private. That's the really the goal as far as the hackers are concerned. They want your name and they want your credit card number. When your credit card number is absolutely fresh out of the box, it's worth about $10 on the black market. That value decays over time because you discover that somebody's stolen your identity. Bad things have happened. Um, I've seen prices as low as 50 cents. Uh, probably that wouldn't work <coughs> to buy you anything. Uh, but that's why people break into TJ Maxx was a, a record in its time. This is when y'all were like three years old. Anybody remember the TJ Maxx break-in? That was a few years ago. This was somebody war driving. That's one of the things y'all should do is war drive. We did a we did a wireless one. That's kind of what led into this. Is we did a pretty good wireless one that we wanted. Did you find a bunch of web uh, broadcasts all over? No, the place? not anymore, luckily. Really? Yeah. Last semester, my students found web all over the place. So they're driving around different neighborhoods than y'all. <laughs> okay, that's just an insecure kind of Wi-Fi um, uh, security, and war driving is going around and looking for it. Um, TJ Maxx was war drived and they broke into the computers and they stayed there for months and the impact was over a billion dollars. That was a financial record at that time. And this is why there's such a thing as organized gang related um, hacking as opposed to uh, loose cannon, some kid with a copy of Colleen um, going and poking into stuff, right? That's uh, nuisance hacking. All of the early hacking, really, really early hacking, was that sort of thing. But there's so much money in it. And the Grand Lynch Blind Act says that these companies have to keep all this stuff in your safe. Now, two things. Number one, they're just not that good at it. Okay? Uh, businesses have a lot of things to do to keep the doors open. And if somebody wants that uh, information, Badly enough, there are so many tools and so many ways to get at it that it's an enormous risk. The Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, this is a special case. This one's really tough. It says that your health information has to be kept private. And that can be very important. All right? So let's say you're, you're four years old and you go to the doctor and you're diagnosed with some sort of heart condition. There's a, a hole in your heart or some kind of problem with your heartbeat. Now, Ideally, you're going to live to about the age of 80, maybe even with a heart defect, right? That means that information has to be kept secure for 76 years. If we figure you're going to finally uh, die at the age of 80, that is longer than any security encryption has ever lasted. I've got another paper I need to finish someday that has a table of the kinds of protections that they put on the data and how long it took for each one to be cracked. One of the first really famous ones was called DES, 
uh, was an encryption scheme, very strong for its day, and a, a project to mount many servers all across the country to try and figure out how to crack that encryption was mounted. And it, it took them a few months, uh, but they did it. And since then, a whole lot of other ones have fallen by the wayside. When you uh, log in, for example, you're logging into uh, your online bank account, that information that you have is hashed and then encrypted. Now the old hash that they used uh, early on at MD4 has it's been cracked. They know how to find the, the value, the actual value of the password that you use. There's a very clever trick that the uh, attackers use called rainbow tables. You just hash everything ahead of time and then you look up the hash. So if someone's eavesdropping on you, uh, is anybody using the public Wi-Fi here right now? Okay. I am too, because I don't have a password, but your information is going out into the universe, and if someone has their network card set up to passive monitor, they can collect your packets, and there'll be a lot of data, they'll have to do a search for it, they'll have to be clever and filter, but if they get a hold of your hash, the next thing is, I didn't do this demo, but you can do it for yourself, just look for online uh, hash. And you can put in the hash value, and it'll tell you what it is. Pick something easy, you can make a, uh, a simple password like one, two, three, four, five, and hash that, and this thing will find it in a second. Now, if you get it long enough and complicated enough, it won't find it. That's why I talk about the, the complicated ones. But MD4 is gone for good. MD5 is still around. Did you all find that one you were looking around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should have switched to SHA probably 256 by now. Even SHA1 has been cracked. So, no matter how powerful it is, there's two things working against you. One is Moore's Law. Have y'all heard of Moore's Law? It's like my, my main issue. What's Moore's Law? Um, well, it's a law created by Intel, uh, the creator of Intel, uh, about, um, yeah, about uh, how the processors, they get smaller over time. That's right, you can double the number of transistors about every 18 months. And depending on who's calculating and how you're counting, basically means that computers just get more and more and more and more powerful. And if you tried to hash all the passwords back in 1992, it would have taken you 600 years. But nowadays, we have a quad-core i7 running 4.2 gigahertz, and you can just blow right through it really quickly. Moore's Law is catching up to all these encryptions. And there's new versions coming on now. Quantum computing and DNA computing is going to crack all those encryptions right now. It is so much faster than the things that we're doing uh, that all that data, all that health data, is that important to you? It is not going to last 76 years. That's just like a broken problem in encryption. There's no way to, to keep it safe. Um, if so you're at school, keep your educational records uh, safe. They require me, for example, to only communicate with my students over the email system used by each That's because of the firm. So that's all that's, that's there that's, that's coded in the law. Really what you're more worried about is the informal. Uh, and this is the one that drives me crazy. So remember, I lived in New York City, so I saw all of the first generation stuff come in. The only people that got it sooner than that, I believe, was London had it in their stuff. But surveillance is just all over the place. I'm not going to go to the link. It's just about um, video cameras. But if you walk around Midtown Manhattan, believe me, this stuff is everywhere. And a lot of it is being attached, this is why I'm talking about London, to artificial intelligence. And they've tried this a couple of times and it didn't work. Now it's beginning to work because artificial intelligence is a lot better. That they would scan the London uh, tube and looking for face recognition for bad guys. Problem is they got a bunch of false positives. So that didn't work for them. But that was a good 12 years ago. Now it's working pretty well. You walk around in Midtown Manhattan, if somebody's interested in you, they know exactly where you were. And they can recognize your face, and that stuff works now. Did you guys, if any of y'all want to read a cool article on the Slack channel, if you're not part of our Slack channel, just send an email in and we can add you into it. Or it's, go to the chat. Yeah, or go to the chat link on our website. It's IRC for 2016. 2017, but in there there's a there's a new um, manufacturer that's making. The thing you guys is they're making oh. a, a handkerchief that goes over your face that is built specifically to 
throw off facial recognition deal. So it has a whole bunch of little digital faces on it. So you can put it on so it messes up the camera. I've, I've seen some things with glasses and then some other things too. 49 bucks. I think you should. Yeah. <laughs> And if you think about how uh, the uh, surveillance from the government level say there was a big demonstration uh, that happened and there's lots of videos of it and then the people who are running that country are going to go take that and face recognize all the people that were in that demonstration, right? That's a level of uh, intrusion upon your civic freedoms. It didn't used to exist because there wasn't artificial intelligence, but Moore's law. And there's a couple other laws that go with it too. There's one that says the amount of RAM that you can do also increases. The amount of density on a hard drive also increases. And that is driving all these things. Social media check-in apps. This is the one that drives me crazy. You can tell from the back in the first place. But generally, I don't have a lot of apps and I don't have a lot of stuff. Um, I can't figure out why somebody would want to check in now. Want all your friends to know that you're at Panera Bread. Well, I mean, right? It's just a consumer idea somehow, and I guess you could meet up, right? Oh, look, Gerald's at Panera Bread, let's go have something on there. So that is just basically giving it away to the companies. Here you are, this is what you're doing, this is what you're buying. Um, people have, have had a little bit of trouble when they were in cautious.